This program is brought to you by Abiding Above Ministries. We want to thank all of you for coming out uh, this afternoon. I know many of you raised your hands earlier saying that you came last night. Did you enjoy last night with High Point? Amen. Praise God. What did they talk about last night in the message? Can you remember? Jacob. Jacob, all right. That's right. He's got it. There, we got a new we got a new car for you out back for that answer. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Well, it's good to see all of you out on this bright and sunny day. I know that the uh, the the light was so bright in here that you couldn't read the uh, lyrics there on the uh, side of the tent. Uh, uh, we thought that might you might could, but it didn't work out. But you know what? I think you knew most of the words anyway. And uh, God blessed our time. I want to talk to you today before lunch. I want to talk to you before lunch about your life in God's hands. Your life in God's hands. And if you, how many of you have a copy of God's Word with you? Anybody? Well, we got about 10 or 15 here. The rest of you forgot your Bibles and you're in an evangelistic event. You need to bring your Bibles if you have one. How many of you are going to be back tomorrow? Raise your hand. All right, everybody raise your hand. You going to be back tomorrow? All right, I want you to do, do me a favor. I want you to bring somebody with you. You knew what I was going to say, didn't you? What would happen if everybody in here brought one person with them? It would what? Double our crowd. And you know what? What if they got saved? You know what? When someone gets saved because you engineered circumstances so they could be under the Word of God, Samuel Rutherford said that makes your heaven two heavens. So I encourage you to bring God's Word tomorrow, and I encourage you to bring uh, a friend. Well, I want to talk about your life in God's hands. And the, I want us to look at James chapter 4. So turn to James chapter 4. I want to read uh, verses 13 through 17, and then I want to explain uh, these verses. James chapter 4, I'll begin reading in verse 13. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Now what he's saying here is this. Sometimes in our arrogance we make all these plans, I'm going to do this. He's saying, no, don't do that. He says, yet, verse 14, yet, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a what? Vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. If I had a bottle here of an aerosol, and if I just sprayed it across here right now, we could all watch it just go away. Listen, compared to eternity, my friend, that is about how long your life is. It's but a vapor, and then you're gone. How many of you notice that you're getting older? Amen? How many of you feel older? And, you know, you can look at my hair today, and I, you can tell I'm getting older and grayer and more wrinkled. You know what? I'm so happy I'm getting older. You know what that means? I'm getting near death. And you know what's so good about that? The Bible says, absent from the body, what? Present with the Lord. Positive thing. Amen. So, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor and appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, your life in God's hands if the Lord wills, we shall live also and also do this or that. Buzz, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I want us to think for just a moment, number one, about the duration of your life. My father-in-law had pastored for many years, been preaching the gospel many years. He had a funeral sermon, and the title of that funeral sermon was this. What have you done with your dash? 1962 to 2014, 
That's the duration of a person's life. What have you done with your dash? What have you done with your life up to this very point? The duration of your life. Again, let's read it, verse 14. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Do you know that God knows exactly, even before the foundation of the world, when you would be born and also when you would die? God knows the duration of your life. He says that He has every hair on your head. What? Number. He knows you intimately. He created you in your mother's womb and He'll be right there when you breathe your last breath one day. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says this, It is appointed unto man to die once and then what? After this comes the judgment. You guys know the scriptures. You've been hearing the scriptures since you were little boys and little girls. Let me ask you, have you surrendered to the one who wrote the scriptures? Have, has he mastered you? So, life, my friend, the duration of your life compared to eternity is very, very short. You're not here but just a little while and then you're gone. Do you realize that people are dying right now while we're under this tent? People are dying all over this city. Some of those who are dying are white people. Some of those who are dying are black people, Hispanic and Chinese. Some of them are young. Some of them are just babies. Some of them are older. Some of them are very, very wealthy. They got more money than they can spend. Some of them, they don't have much. But you know what they all have in common? They're dying right now. No matter how much you accumulate, if you could have the very the car that you wanted, lived in the house that you wanted to live in, have all the finest of the clothes, there's still a problem that you and I have. There is a duration about our life. We are going to die according to Scripture. And we're going to stand before the very one who made us. So my friend, life is but a vapor. Life is... It's short. We see it, it appears, and then it's like it evaporates. How like your life. Many times when I've been in the hospital and I've talked with people as they were dying, maybe over a number of weeks or months as they were dying with cancer, I would go visit them and everyone knew that it was very near their death. And sometimes it would be so obvious to me that they were going to expire within a few moments that I would gather the family around the bed and we would hold hands. We might sing a hymn, read some scripture, because we knew just in a moment they were going to breathe their last breath. I remember one time many years ago, I was standing over the bed of one particular woman. She was lying there. We had held hands, sang a hymn, we had prayed, and I leaned down to say a few words to her up close. And as I did, she breathed her last breath right when my face was up close to her so she could hear me. She breathed her last breath, and I could feel her breath go across my cheek just like that. And I knew she's gone. I stood up and I told the family she's gone. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Her last breath across my face. You see, her, she had a duration of life. And at that moment, it was time for her to go. I'm going to have that moment one day. Some of you are going to have that moment one day. More than likely in a crowd this size, one of you are going to die probably within two or three weeks or a month. You could find yourself breathing your last breath. It could be from illness. It could be from violence because we live in a very violent city. Memphis is one of the most violent cities in the United States of America. You really have to be careful. You could lose your life down here. Is that, is that true or is that my imagination? You could lose your life down here, right? Life is short. You could lose your life anywhere. Absolutely. So life is short, but life also is significant. Have you ever wondered why God created you to begin with? 
Why are you even here? Well, why did God put you in your mother? She carried you nine months, safely delivered you. Why did all that happen? Listen, I want to tell you. There is no way it could have happened apart from the will of God. Amen? Amen. The reason you're here is because of the will of God. Your life has a duration. Your life is short compared to eternity. And my friend, your life has significance. I want to ask you. So far, what's the influence of your life been like? Has your life made a good impact on others? Or would you say, no, my life has made a bad impact? Because it's one or the other. Your life is either either being a blessing and bringing glory to God who created you and gave you this duration of time, or your life is having a bad influence, not bringing glory to God, not doing according to the will that He put you here to begin with. So your life is short. And my friend, your life is significant. Romans chapter 14 verse 7 says, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. You can't just live a life not making an impact. It's impossible. Your life is making an impact, whether for good or bad, it's doing something. Even if you sleep and you don't accomplish much, and you're not involved. Whoever's related to you, boys and girls who might watch you, you are impacting them for either good or bad. And so, we see that our life is very short. It's just a vapor, and then it's gone away. I want to ask you, when your time on earth is through, this brief life, significant life, when it's through, let me ask you, will you wake up When you breathe your last breath out of your body, will you wake up in the presence of God or will you wake up in the presence of hell with Satan and his demons? When you breathe your last breath and you find yourself out of this present world into another world, listen, what world will it be in? Which one will it be? Revelation chapter 22, verse 11 says this. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And let the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Listen, my friend, there's coming a day when you breathe your last breath, what you are will be the way you are for all eternity. You'll either be a child of God for all eternity, there's no ending, or you'll be a child of the disobedient one, according to Ephesians 2, forever and ever and ever. You see, your life here on earth has a duration. You're born, and then you'll die. But listen, when you slip into eternity, my friend, there is only one duration. It is forever and ever and ever, and no way to change that state, whether it's the place called heaven or it's a place called hell. And so, that is the duration of your life. But I want you to look at the second thing is this. Not only is there the duration of your life, there is the danger of your life. Listen closely to this. There is the danger of your life. The supreme danger in the life is to live without God. Because my friend, when you live without God, you live according to this society. And my friend, according to the Word of God, this culture and this society as we know it is on a high way to hell. There's a wide road that leads to destruction. There's a narrow road that leads to eternal life. The Bible clearly says many are on the wide road and only a few are on the narrow road. So living this life, this duration of time, this short and significant, but living it dangerously means you're living selfishly. God did not put us here on this earth just to gratify our fleshly desires. 
God put us on this earth. He put you on this earth for a purpose, not to live selfishly, not to enter, entertain myself until my duration of time on this earth is over. He didn't want us to live selfishly. He didn't want us to take our own time into our own hands. God has gifted each one of you in a special way. God has given you a talent. God would not have you and me to use our time, to use our talent for our own selfish purposes. In a sense, many dethrone God and try living their life selfishly, enthroning themselves. Now, we can't dethrone God. That's impossible. He is Lord, always has been, always will be. But the way we live our life during this duration of time, listen, when you live your life dangerously, you're living your life selfishly. When you live according to what you want to do, according to your time, according to your talent, instead of saying my time on earth and my talent, what I'm good at, what I'm gifted to do, is for the Lord. It's not for selfish pursuits. And so we, you and I need to be very careful with living a selfish life. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And then I want to read in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. You've heard of the parable of the rich man? Listen to this. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. You hear that? Me, me, me. I, I, I. My, my, my. All my goods. All my grains. That's how he thought. He's living selfishly. And he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, what did he say? He said, you fool. You, you got it. Most of you know that. He said, you fool. Do you not know that your life is required of you tonight? Your life is required of you. And so this very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? Verse 21, so is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Our biggest problem as human beings, it's been my biggest problem, is living selfishly. Wanting everything that I could get. Holding on to everything I could get. Listen, when you die, my friend, you leave it all. You'll never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. You cannot take it with you. And I want to tell you, when you open the lower part of a casket, whether you're rich or poor matters not. Every corpse in that casket is barefoot. You go out of this world barefooted, no matter how much you accumulate. And so you and I are not to be men and women who live our lives selfishly. That is a danger to live selfishly. Living selfishly is to live sinfully. James chapter 4 verse 17 again says, therefore to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I, I would say this, the majority of people right here, right now, if I were to say write down ten things that you know that God would have you to do, I guarantee you, you would understand salvation, you would understand what God intended for your life. You would know exactly what he wants you to do. This is our problem. We are choosing moment by moment and day by day simply not to do what deep down in our hearts we know God is calling us to do. We're saying no to him 
and yes to me. We're dethroning God in our life and we're enthroning ourselves. And this is the sad thing. According to Scripture, there is a duration of your life. There's a duration of my life. We live for just a little while and then we're gone. But the thing is this. What we do in that little moment of time, that duration of time, whether we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive Him as our Savior, my friend, counts for all eternity. One of the wisest things you could do this afternoon before the night's service is walk over to a local cemetery and just sit there and think, think seriously as you look at the dates on all those tombstones and then come back tonight planning to worship God with your whole being. The one who created you. The one who loves you. The one who desires to live in and through you. The wisest thing you could do is allow yourself to look at death and realize there's a duration and there's a danger and I'm right in the middle of it right now between when I was born and between when I'll die. And so, the parable of the rich man we see, it was all about him. He was living selfishly, and we tend to live simply. I was talking to a young college graduate one year, and uh, I asked him, I said, um, what are you going to do when you graduate? And he said, well, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I said, well, what are you going to do then? He said, well, I'm going to get rich. And I said, okay, you're going to be a lawyer? You're going to get rich? I said, what are you going to do then? He said, I've got it in my mind, the exact house that I'm going to buy. I even know that I'm going to have a beautiful wife. I said, how do you know you're going to have a beautiful wife? Because I'm going to have money, is what he said. And I said, okay, then what? He said, well, we'll have some children. I said, all right, then what? He said, we're going to have enough money to buy a second home on the lake. I said, okay, then what? He said, well, I'm going to retire and we're going to travel the world. That's a plan, a life goal in my life. I said, that'd be wonderful. I know you'll enjoy that. I said, but then what? He said, well, he said, well, I guess I'll die. And I said, then what? And you know what he told me? Seriously, it's a true story. You know what he told me? He said, you know, I've never thought about that. You know what I told him? I told him something a, a friend of mine's little boy said to him when they left church one day. The little boy looked up his dad and said, Dad, it seems to me that we're going to be dead a lot longer than we're alive. And so I started witnessing to this young graduate and eventually we got on our knees and he prayed and asked Christ to come into his heart. Amen. And I said, okay, now go pursue your dream under the control of God who now lives in you. Because no matter what you accumulate, you're going to leave it behind. Send it on ahead by what you do for God. The duration of life, the dangers of life, the last thing I want to say is this, the duty of your life. My friend, you have a duty to be in neutral and do nothing and you have eyes, ears, hands, legs, feet. My friend, there is no way that can possibly be right. To do nothing, there is no way God intended you to be on this earth in this duration of time and do nothing. I can tell you this, in between jobs, I can tell you what you can do. You can tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And simply tell them that there's only one way to get to heaven when you die, and it's through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. You can do that the rest of your life. I want to tell you that. You know what happens every time you lead someone to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know what happens? That makes your heaven two heavens, yes. But you know, that's, that's more precious to God than anything you could ever possibly accumulate here on this earth. 
You say, well, I don't have anything. That's for people like you. No, my friend, God would have you as a blood-bought child of God to go and tell other people how to be saved. And keep doing that. And I want to tell you, you'll be rich in heaven. See, we've got it all backwards. We've got it all upside down. There is a duty of your life. James 4.15 says, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. You know what? You know what that means? That you and I should stop and do like this young graduate who wanted to be a lawyer. We need to stop and say, no matter what my personal life goals and dreams are, I'm going to stop today and I'm going to acknowledge God's will. Period. What is the will of God? And I can tell you, the will of God for you in this short duration of time, it's not about you. It's about Him. My friend, you are simply a tool in the hand of God to serve God and live according to His will until you breathe that last breath. It's not for drink. It's not for drugs. It's not for sex. That's the devil's lie. And what the devil is doing, even under this tent, he's blinding the minds of the unbeliever to keep you from from believing in the Lord Jesus Christ because this is what Satan knows. If I can keep them distracted, if I can keep them busy, drunk, high, long enough, they will breathe their last breath and I'll have her. I'll have him and not God. That's what's going on even under this tent. That's what's going on all across this city, everywhere in the world. Satan is delaying and delaying and delaying people from stopping to think, what happens when I die? Until they're dead and he has them. Listen, not temporarily. He has them for all eternity. And I want to tell you something, my friend. Hell is filled with people who were going to wait for a more convenient time to believe. And then they breathed their last breath before that came. And I want to tell you, they died without Christ. There is a duration to your life. There's dangers from procrastinating. And you have a duty. You need to acknowledge God's will. And you need to live your life accomplishing God's will. You see, God's will operates for you in three basic ways. First of all, there's the basic way of salvation. In other words, you come to a point in your life and you realize, I'm lost. Just like this young boy who wanted, a young man wanted to be a lawyer. He realized by talking to me, he he realized, wow, what am I living for? I haven't really stopped to think about death. I've been planning my life, but I hadn't planned my death. Life is short. Death, my friend, is is eternal as far as where you'll spend eternity. There is salvation. But now listen, after salvation, there's a word called sanctification. Don't let that word scare you off. That is simply you becoming more and more like Christ as you live on this earth till God calls you home. You say, well, how would God make me more like Jesus Christ? First of all, my friend, at salvation, He comes to live inside of you. By His Holy Spirit, He lives in you. He looks through your eyes. He listens with your ears. He loves other people from your heart. He serves other people with your hands. He walks in your step. Christ in you, oil in the lamp, gas in the car, ink in the pen, Christ in the Christian. Let me ask you, is he living in you now? Or have you been living, believing Satan's lies? Has your believing and salvation been delayed all these years since you were a baby because all the things of the world that appeals to your five senses are fogging and veiling your mind so you've yet to believe? My friend, don't breathe your last breath in that state. That is an eternal decision that you need to make. And the danger is living selfishly and living life right to the end, not realizing life is short. What was I thinking? And now I head into an eternity with Satan and his demons. So God would have you to be saved. And then after you're saved, because you're now empowered by His indwelling Holy Spirit, you say, well, I want to quit drinking. I want to quit doing drugs. 
I want to quit going after prostitutes. I'll tell you how. Be saved. Know that Christ now lives in you. And when Satan knocks on your door to, and you're being tempted, instead of you fighting Satan, you just stand back and you say, Holy Spirit within me, please go answer the door. If you do that, your desire for drink, drugs, prostitute, crack, whatever it may be, listen, it will go away gradually. I'm not going to promise you a pie in the sky, but I can promise you this. It may not go away instantly. I pray that it will. But I can tell you this, it will go away gradually. As the temptation comes your way, you back up and say, Spirit of God, go answer the door. Because if I answer it, I'm going to fail once again. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Let me tell you the good news. Once the Spirit of God comes into you, it is absolutely impossible to ever lose Him. But if you go out here today and you drink you a six-pack, you know what happens? It wears off. You have to go get another one. You go out and take some kind of a drug, whether it's legal or illegal, it gets you high, and you feel heavenly. And then you come down and you feel devilly. <laughs> and you know what? It wears off. You have to go get money to go buy more. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and His Spirit comes into you, my friend, He is there forever and He never sleeps nor slumbers. He's there. He's living through you and you abide in Him and let Him live His life through you because you can't do it. You know deep down you can't do it. What you're longing for is God to genuinely be in you, living through you, as you sit down and rest in Him. So there's salvation, there's sanctification, and you know what happens when you're walking in the Spirit? Service is not trying to get God to be pleased with you. He's already pleased with you because He sees you in Christ Jesus. The reason you serve is not to make the pastor happy, not to get God off your back, not to do your share, to do your part. Listen, when you're saved and you know it, and when you are living surrender to God, you cannot help but serve. My friend, you're going to serve somehow many times not even realizing what you're doing. That's called the Spirit-filled life on earth. And listen, that's what deep down inside of you you're longing to be and do. But you've been deceived by Satan who substituted drink, drugs, and the world system for simply being saved, sanctified, and serving the living God. He put you on this earth to live inside of you and to live through you and to inspire and make an impact on those around you so that they too would see Christ and one day <clears throat> believe and receive Him. Amen? Amen? What have you done with your dash? What's your life been like up to this very point? Have you been living dangerously? Selfishly? Have you been living like it? James chapter 4 says, I will do this, I will do that, I will go here, I will be that. you got to stop all that today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here under this tent this morning, God speaking to your heart by His Spirit, and you're beginning to think like this young graduate, then what? I'm giving you the answer right now to then what? Right now. And don't put it off. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Picture in your mind the cross. Picture Jesus on that cross. Picture Him hanging there. Picture Him hanging there with all of your sin placed upon Him. See that picture. Jesus on the cross. All my sins on Him. Hear Him cry out right now. My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? Now see Him on the cross. He's completely dead on the cross. Having died with all your sin and yourself... Put your childlike trust right there on the cross, on Christ, with all of your sins. And believe 
He died in that spot on purpose and for me on purpose. The same way I was born on purpose, I can be born again on purpose. Believe that Jesus died as my substitute. Put your trust in Him for the payment of your sin because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. You say, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what? Thou shalt be saved. Amen? Amen. Right now, I want you to pray with me. I'm going to pray and I want you to follow me in prayer. I want you to do it out loud if you want to believe. You can pray with me right now. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. I put all my trust in this fact alone. Jesus Christ died for me personally. I believe that with all of my heart. I ask you now to come into my heart and save me. Thank you now for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me right now, I want you to just stand up. If you just prayed that prayer right now, you stand up. If you didn't pray it, keep seated. But if you pray just now, just stand up. Raise your hands, both hands up right now. Right now, raise your hands. I want to pray for you right now. Dear Lord, I lift up my hands to you and my heart to you, and I ask you, Father, thank you, Father, for saving them. Father, I ask you to protect them now as they begin sanctification, growing into Christ's likeness. Cause them, Father, to serve you and be satisfied simply with their relationship with you. And this is our, keep them, Father, from the evil one. Keep them from wrongful influence. Involve them here at Memphis Union Mission. Involve them in discipleship. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You've been listening to Abiding Above Ministries with Chris Hodges. If you would like Chris to speak at your church or event, please go to our website, abidingabove.org. God bless you and make you a blessing.